I am not encouraging or advising anyone to modify their firearms. This is for entertainment and educational purposes only. What's up everyone? I am on a quest to quantify as many aspects of my 1911 trigger jobs as I can. I hope to make my trigger jobs more repeatable so they consistently produce my desired trigger action and weight. I have quantified my sear tip and hammer hook geometry and their engagement relationship adequately for my purposes and desired performance. Links to my two videos about that are in the description along with a playlist of all my technical 1911 content. Next up is sear spring adjustment. This video will be a detailed look at 1911 sear springs, how I adjust them and what aspects of that adjustment I have been able to quantify. Let's get into it. We're going to start off by defining some terminology to make sure we are all on the same page in terms of what we are discussing here. This is the sear spring, left and right as if it were installed in the gun with the muzzle facing away from us. I will be calling these individual arms leaves or tangs. This one is the left or sear tang. This one is the center or disconnector tang. We won't be talking about the right or grip safety tang. Of course, it's an integral part of the sear spring and the safety functions of the pistol. The grip safety physically blocks the trigger bow from traveling rearward, but it does not affect trigger weight or action once it is disengaged when you grip the pistol. This is the trigger, trigger shoe, trigger bow. This is the sear. This is the tip of the sear. This top face right here is the primary face of the sear. And I will call these little guys the legs of the sear. This is the disconnector. Uh, we're primarily going to be dealing with this end of it, which I will call the base. I may refer to this uh, wider part of it as like the paddle. This is the hammer. These little guys right here are the hammer hooks and we're primarily concerned with the face that my screwdriver is parallel with as that is what engages with the sear primary face. This is the hammer strut. This is the mainspring. This is compressed by the hammer strut in the mainspring housing. In terms of trigger action, this is the take up. That is the pre-travel to the wall. Past the wall is the break of the trigger when the sear releases the hammer. After the action cycles, when we let our finger off the trigger and allow the trigger to come back forward, back out to the wall or close to it, that is the trigger reset. Here is a transcription of the original 1911 sear spring diagram from the M1911 manual by Jerry Kuhnhausen. The top view is the flat pattern before it is bent into shape. The bottom diagram of the bent sear spring shows us some interesting dimensions, geometry, and features. There is a call out for a specific bend radius of the spring. Then there are some measurements further defining the forms and positions of the individual tanks. I tried to use this diagram to develop some of my own measurement points to quantify my sear spring adjustment and that didn't really work. It got way too complicated and hard to measure. There are of course different kinds of sear springs that deviate from the original design. They are generally reduced power for more modern, lighter 1911 trigger actions and weight. An interesting note in the Colt 45 automatic book, also by Jerry Kuhnhausen, is that the reduced power sear springs, or different springs in general, may be stamped out of varying thicknesses of steel or have different curvatures. I have not found this to be the case. I bought three sear springs for this video and measured and inspected some more out of my pistols. They are all 31 thousandths thick as called out in the diagram. They all have very similar curvature at the base here but they vary in the positions of the sear and disconnector leaves and the grip safety tang. What generally differentiates reduced power from standard sear springs is these relief cuts right here on the sear and disconnector tang. Less material is being bent, so the individual spring tangs are less stiff than the original design. This one is a wolf spring of the original design we saw in the diagram. This is a reduced power sear spring from Wolf. This one is a factory Colt reduced power sear spring offered by EGW. If I need a new sear spring for whatever reason, I buy these. That is because the disconnector tang and the grip safety tang are already beveled. And the only thing I need to do to these other than adjust them is polish right here and right here. 
There are two other kinds of sear springs I don't have. Uh, one is the Clark's Custom Spring with a split disconnector tang. One little arm of the center tang rests on the disconnector and one on the trigger bow, which gives more flexibility in the adjustment and seems to have been developed to remedy an issue with trigger bounce that I've never encountered. The next one is called the Evolved Spring from EGW. The reasons that it is very special are listed down below the picture. I do not have any firsthand experience with these two springs, so I will not be discussing them any further. Sear spring material and heat treatment can also greatly affect sear spring tension and function. Every single trigger job I've done on the 1911 has used this type of spring. This is by far the most common and it is what is most likely to come in any 1911 you buy. They've always worked fine for me and what I have developed my process around. I think it is very important to know how the sear spring functions and how it interacts with all the other components in the ignition system. That will give us the best chance at understanding exactly what our adjustments to the spring might do. The left tang only contacts the left leg of the sear. It has one job and that is to pivot the sear into engagement with the hammer hooks. The center tang only contacts the disconnector. It pushes the disconnector up and forward into the back of the trigger bow. The right tang puts spring tension on your grip safety. I'm just throwing that in for completeness. Each arm of this spring is a spring in and of itself, and each tang can be adjusted individually. When the spring is installed in the pistol, you slide the main spring housing up into place, and it squishes this curvature of the spring inward, and this preloads the tangs into their relative components. Then the adjustment or bend of these individual tangs can change the preload on the individual components that they contact. Let's look at a full cycle of the trigger action to see how the sear spring operates. I designed and 3D printed this fixture that holds all the other components close to where they would be in the pistol around the sear and the hammer in this little jig right here. I've also made a representation of the slide. The main spring is further away from the hammer strut to reduce spring force. Not a lot is needed for this demonstration. This main spring would normally be, you know, compressed in the main spring housing and then moved closer up to the hammer strut. I will link to a couple of good 3D animations and a really cool video showing a classic teaching tool for 1911 gunsmiths and armorers in the description as well, but I wanted to demonstrate this with the actual components from a pistol. In the cocked position, the hammer strut has compressed the mainspring. The left sear spring tang has pivoted the sear tip into engagement with the hammer hooks and is holding it in the cocked position against the force from that compressed mainspring that is trying to pivot the hammer forward. The disconnector is being pushed up by the center tang of the sear spring into the disconnector pocket in the bottom of the slide, which is over the disconnector tip when the slide is in battery. It is also pushing the disconnector forward into the back of the trigger bow. You can see at this point the disconnector is not contacting the sear legs. Right now, the grip safety is blocking the trigger bow from traveling rearward. Gripping the pistol disengages the grip safety and allows that trigger bow to move rearward all the way. I'm going to get the grip safety out of our way now. I will put my finger on the trigger and press through the take up to the wall. The trigger bow pivots the disconnector back into contact with the sear legs against the force from only the center spring tang. As we pull through the wall and break the trigger, the trigger bow pushes on the disconnector which pushes on the sear legs and pivots the tip of the sear out from under the hammer hooks, releasing the hammer. It pivots forward with force provided by the mainspring, hits the firing pin, and fires the round. The slide starts coming rearward. It pivots the hammer back and it pushes the disconnector down as the tip of the disconnector comes out of the front of the pocket in the slide. This pushes the disconnector base down under the sear legs. Even though we are holding the trigger to the rear, this disconnects the trigger bow from the sear and allows the left sear spring tang to pivot the sear tip into the hammer, which catches the hammer hooks as the hammer is reset by the slide moving over the top of it. Now the sear is engaged with the hammer hooks. The hammer is cocked again and the slide has gone back forward into battery. The pocket in the slide is once again over the disconnector. As I let my finger off the trigger, the middle tang of the sear spring pushes the disconnector and trigger bar forward. As soon as the disconnector clears the front edge of the sear legs, the middle spring tang forces it back up into the pocket in the slide 
and the base into position in front of the sear legs. Letting my finger all the way off the trigger, a gap once again opens up between the disconnector and sear legs and the whole cycle can restart with the next shot. Let's look at the whole sequence a couple of times uninterrupted. Let's clearly define how the individual tangs of the sear spring affect trigger action starting with the left or sear tang. I have removed the disconnector and trigger so it's easier to see. Here is the left spring tang. It is only contacting the left leg of the sear. This only the pivots the sear into engagement with the hammer. So the adjustment of this tang and the preload on the sear leg only affects trigger brake weight. How much does it affect trigger brake weight? Quite a bit. An excerpt from the Kuhnhausen manual states it can change trigger brake weight two pounds or more. I am presenting values from the Kuhnhausen manual because I agree with them based on my experience. The center or disconnector tang does triple duty. It is the only thing affecting trigger take up weight. Then once the disconnector is in contact with the sear legs, it also opposes the sear pivoting out from under the hammer hooks and therefore also affects trigger brake weight. After the slide has cycled and the disconnector has disconnected, you can see that the center tang is the only thing affecting the reset of the trigger. It is the only thing pushing that disconnector and trigger bow back forward. Kuhnhausen states the adjustment of the center leaf can account for the first one to one and a half pounds of the trigger pull weight. I interpret this to mean the take up weight. Now this excerpt says it can also add one to one and a half pounds to the trigger pull weight. I interpret this to mean the brake weight because it is mentioned in the same note that includes how much weight the sear tang adjustment can add and that can only affect the brake weight. The sear tip and hammer hook engagement relationship can have a significant effect on trigger brake weight. If you want more details on exactly how, check out the first two videos that are linked in the description. The mainspring forces the hammer hooks into engagement with the sear, putting pressure on that interface. This affects how hard it is to pivot the sear tip out from under the hammer hooks. This only affects trigger brake weight. Friction at the interface of any of the components we have discussed will increase trigger take up weight and brake weight and decrease reset positivity. Whenever I do a trigger job, every single interface between components gets polished. How crazy I go with my polishing depends on my desired trigger action and weight. Before we get into the adjustment of the sear spring, we need an extra special safety disclaimer. Improper adjustment of the sear spring can result in unsafe conditions with your pistol like inadequate sear engagement and improper disconnector function. The third link in the description is a video about 1911 safety checks. Please watch it. If you do any sear spring adjustment, always make sure the pistol passes every single one of these safety checks before loading it and putting it into service. Another quick disclaimer, springs take a set from being cycled and can relax a little. Referring to the Kuhnhausen manual again, it is recommended that you adjust the trigger brake weight higher initially. The spring will likely take a set over a few hundred rounds and the weight may drop. I've also had the opposite happen to me. I adjusted a sear spring and the trigger pull weight crept back up about a half a pound with use. In any case, sear springs are adjusted. After the gun is fired a few hundred times, they will likely need readjusted. Okay, geez, let's finally get to the adjustments. I have my desired mainspring installed in my mainspring housing. All the components are polished and my sear and hammer geometry are established. And I've put a couple of drops of oil on the components. I'm not gonna show how I quickly take apart and put the gun back together to make these adjustments. I've already done that and you guessed it. A link to that video is the fourth one in the description. The tool I use for this is a trigger pull gauge. I specifically use a mechanical spring gauge because it's easier for me to feel the take up in the wall. This would be very difficult for me with an electronic gauge and I've tried that before. The spring gauge has worked great for my purposes for years and it was like 18 bucks. A new sear spring is installed in here, the EGW-1. I have not made any adjustments to it. This is exactly how it came out of the bag. Let's measure the take up and brake weight. Take up weight seems to be just a hair under one and a half pounds. Brake weight, five and a quarter. Five and a quarter again. My desired take up weight is between one and one and a half pounds. This one was 
right at one and a half pounds, maybe a little bit below. If I wanted to lower that, I would bend this middle spring tang back. This is the first aspect of sear spring adjustment I'm quantifying. I have found that below one pound of take up weight, you run into disconnector function and trigger reset issues. Above one and a half pounds, well, I just don't like the feel of that and it is likely to make my trigger brake weight too heavy. Coincidentally, after I determined this range, I found that Mr. Kuhnhausen already figured this out, or at least with how I interpreted this note that was shown earlier. This is less about trigger take-up weight. I'm using quantification of the trigger take-up weight, which is easy to measure with my gauge, to ensure I have proper disconnector function and the positivity of the reset that I want. Trigger reset weight or action would be much harder to measure. For trigger brake weights, three and a half pounds and above, I adjust this middle tang to give me a take up weight closer to one and a half pounds. 3.5 pound break weight and under, I generally set it closer to one pound. Let's say I want to adjust this trigger to a four pound break weight. I'm gonna go ahead and set this take up around one and a quarter pounds to start. We were a bit above that, so I need to adjust the middle tang back just a smidge. That's a bit too light. This can take a bit of time and multiple adjustments to get it where you want. Okay, that's right there at one and a quarter pounds. It's slightly below where it was when I started. Let's check the brake weight after I made that middle sear tang adjustment because we know that it can affect brake weight. Didn't really change, we're still right around five and a quarter pounds. Now I'm going to adjust the left sear tang, generally, you know, in this direction for a little bit less tension to achieve my desired break weight. This is the second aspect of the sear spring adjustment that I'm quantifying. Of course, this is the one everyone else measures as well. Remember the left sear tang only affects break weight. This will also take some time and multiple adjustments. Sometimes you have to cycle the action and the trigger a few times for things to set into where they need to be. Now we're at four and three quarter pounds, still need to go lighter. If I'm having trouble getting my brake weight low enough, that's when I may have to go back and adjust the middle sear tang again, then retry this adjustment. If that doesn't get the brake weight low enough, it's back to recutting my sear tip and adjusting the engagement relationship with the hammer hooks. Okay, down to four and a half, we're sneaking up on it. All right, that's adjusted. Here's my final break weight. It's a smidge more than four pounds. That's fine, I'll check and readjust after a couple hundred rounds. The last thing, of course, is to safety check the pistol. Generally, where issues with this sear spring adjustment will come up is if you drop the slide from the slide stop on an empty chamber. If you do that and the hammer falls to the safety catch, the first thing I look at is the left sear tang adjustment. I probably don't have it pushing the sear into engagement hard enough with the hammer hooks, but doing that will increase trigger brake weight. So the center tang might need to be adjusted again to account for this, but not to a take up of less than one pound. If that doesn't work, again, you're looking at sear tip geometry. It may need to be adjusted for more engagement depth or a more positive relationship with the hammer hooks. That's the process I use. It's been working good for me. Quantification of the take up weight is the newest development to my sear spring adjustment process that has been helpful uh, for me to produce more repeatable results and kind of quantify um, the positivity of that trigger reset as well as kind of the disconnector action. I hope I've shown that the trigger take up and break weight and reset positivity depend on a whole lot more than the sear spring adjustment. That is really important to keep in mind. There is sometimes a delicate balance between the selected components, their geometry, interactions, and the adjustment of the sear spring, especially when you get into really low trigger weights. The last part of the trigger job is setting the pre-travel and over-travel. Unsurprisingly, I've quantified that already. I'll make a short video before long. It's pretty straightforward. Anyways, I hope this was helpful, interesting, and informative. Thanks so much for watching. Stay curious. I'll catch you next time.